okay? Now, in a contract, you can assign the contract. An assignment is the transfer of the rights or the duties of that contract to some other person. You will see this in those people that are call themselves wholesalers or bird dogs, where they go under contract to buy a property and then they assign their right to buy to another buyer and they usually add a fee to that and that's how those wholesalers make money, all right? They go under contract to buy a seller's house for a hundred grand and then they go find another buyer and say, hey, will you buy this house for 110? And they assign the right to buy the house at 100 and they keep the 10,000. So the assignment is the transfer of rights. Typically in an assignment, the original party still maintains their responsibility, okay? So that original buyer still has uh, maintains. If that third party goes, oh, I've decided I'm not going to, that doesn't cancel the original purchase agreement between the assignor and the seller. A novation is a complete substitution of the contract or a substitution of a part of the contract. Now, let's go back to this because I am sure that there are many of you that said, well, <clears throat> we closed on our house and we wrote 30 days, but we had to get an extension for some reason. Yes, you can do that, all right? You can do that as long as both parties agree. If you get to day 29 and you go, hey, dude, I want to, uh, uh, my lender's on vacation. He can't close tomorrow, but he said he'd be back Monday. Can we close on Monday? And the seller says, sure, we will novate or change that closing date from this day here, and I'll give you three more days. You have to do that because if you don't legally extend that date on day 31, one of those parties is out of contract, okay? So that is a substitution or a novation. Banks will do this a lot. Banks love to do this where they go, um, you get a bunch of counter offers. I had a deal with a bank years ago where it ended up being like 14 counter offers. And I kid you not with the purchase agreement and all the counters was that thick. What the bank came back to me and did and asked was, hey, <clears throat> let's take all of these 14 pages. And what I want you to do is rewrite a new offer with all of the terms that we finally agreed upon in one offer and we will accept that contract so that we don't have to deal with counter number one and counter number eight. Well, counter number eight said this about counter number five. And so you ended up rewriting a new offer to substitute for the existing offer. Now, there are people that have said, well, great, we'll just ask for a novation to substitute, and then we just won't sign it. No, that does not relieve you. The novation, before you sign it, you're still under the original 14-page one. So the failure to sign that novation does not relieve you because you still have the original one. So I've seen investors try this where they said, well, just ask for the bank to novate the offer or the purchase agreement. We'll get a new one. And when they send that over, we won't sign and therefore we'll be out of this deal. No, that substitution offer is replacing the existing offer that you are currently under contract for. One party or the other could breach the contract. Breach is when one party fails to do what they are supposed to do. And there could be a breach on either side. If the seller defaults, then the seller 
Um, if the seller defaults, the buyer may take one of the actions. There is a suit called specific performance. The seller failed to perform, so the buyer is going to sue. And he is going to sue for damages. This will occur where the buyer goes through and makes the offer, the seller accepts it. Then the buyer pays for an inspection, pays his lender for the appraisal, and the seller all of a sudden goes, I've decided I don't want to sell because this is where little Timmy grew up and I don't want to tug at the heartstrings, so we're not going to sell. Well, the buyer says, dude, I've put out $800 and that's not a legal reason. I am going to sue you for specific performance and I want you to pay me that $800 I've paid out as damages because if we wouldn't have entered into this, I wouldn't have spent that. If the buyer defaults, say the buyer says, hey, dude, I just don't like purple. I'm not going to sue or I'm not going to buy. Then the same specific performance could be out because the seller could say, dude, I have taken the house off the market for 30 days. That's what you ask for in your time is of the essence. I have missed all these other sellers, or I'm sorry, I misspoke. I have missed all these other buyers, and now you tell me you don't want to buy? I have been harmed. I am going to sue you for specific performance, all right? This, he could also sue for damages. Now, they are called liquidated damages. That is what they get paid. I lost a potential buyer. That cost me one house payment. That's an easy one to prove in a court of law because you should have closed today. I would have paid my loan off. Now I got to get a new buyer. It'll be next month. I've got at least one month of payment of houses, house payment that I wouldn't have had if you'd have done. So I'm harmed there and maybe one month of taxes. All right. There are statute of limitations to enforce these rights. Um, I am not a practicing attorney and probably you are not either. So if this comes up, uh, the suit for specific performance because one party or the other doesn't do what they're supposed to, I would suggest you reach out to an attorney to talk about, well, how much time do we actually have to sue for a specific performance? Different states have different time frames, and depending on what that actual suit is, could be a different time frame as well. Now, there could be other reasons that this contract gets terminated. <laughs> so hold on. <laughs> <coughs> Trying to drink coffee and then swallow. I wonder if Aquaman could breathe coffee. Maybe that's what I need some gills or something. All right, I'm back. There could be other reasons to terminate a contract, okay? So let's talk about some other reasons. There's this thing called partial performance. Maybe I did not wash the back trunk of your car, but you had to leave and you agree that the trunk was clean. So we agreed that both parties agreed that that was close enough. That's partial performance. It could also be considered substantial performance, okay? Now, this happens in new builds a lot, where a new builder or a, your buyer will build a new home and they're due to close in December. And part of that home is that they get at their front yard sodded with grass and a tree planted. Well, they necessarily maybe couldn't do that in December, depending on where you live. So the builder says, hey, look, we can either wait till May and you take ownership or we can close in December. And then in May, we will come back and finish the contract. That could be a partial performance by both parties or a substantial performance. There could be an impossibility of the contract to actually be performed. Now, historically, this is getting 
a couple years out, so some of you may not remember, but years ago, eight years ago, in Indiana, there was a tornado that went through and destroyed the Indiana State Fairgrounds. And part of the destruction was the stage in which all of the musical acts were due to perform that week at the state fairgrounds. Well, this tornado went through like on a Wednesday and completely destroyed the grandstands and the stage. Those bands that were due to play on Thursday were canceled and Friday and Saturday. And they were canceled because you cannot perform on a stage that's not there. So they could, it was impossible to complete or fulfill this contract due to the legally impossible act. They couldn't do it. There just was no stage. All right. Now, here's another one. Remember this word, mutual, both parties, bilateral. You guys could both agree. You know, the buyer could say something like, well, I, I know I'm under contract to buy this property, but I just got a pay reduction in work and it's going to be really tight for me to make this payment. And the seller says, you know what? I actually have another buyer who's going to offer more. Why don't we both just agree to let this purchase contract go away and we'll just all move on with our life. All right. So both parties could agree it will happen. There could be an operation of law that might happen. Remember, a contract that was voidable could get undone or rescinded because of one of the issues of the contract. Hey, con uh, Sean was not of legal age. We're going to void this contract because it's voidable. Now, I've mentioned this word either before, a recension. The contract could be rescinded prior to it actually being accepted. During a recension, all parties get returned to the original position they were in as if it never happened. All right. So here's the best way that I think about it. And Please do not get offended. <laughs> but there is a difference between a marriage being in divorce and a marriage ending in an annulment. All right. A divorce means you were under contract and now you're not. And one party may be financially liable to the other. An annulment is where the marriage never happened. Both parties are reinstated back to their original position. That's what a recension is. So if a buyer walks in and hands you a purchase agreement and hands you the earnest money check and then walks out and says, you know what? I've changed my mind. I'm not going to make an offer. He walks back in and says, I want to rescind my offer and I want my earnest money check back because it gets reinstated as if it never happened, okay? Now, there are some contracts that are used in real estate. I am going to tell you now, there is no question on the test that says name five types of contract used in real estate. But there is one I want to point out right here, an option. An option is the right of a party to do something in the future based upon the terms we agree upon today. Layaway. And what is layaway? It is a unilateral contract. And think back to what I told you at the very beginning. All contracts in real estate are bilateral except one. And this is it. I want you to highlight that, mark it, put a star beside it, do whatever you want to do. But you need to understand that the option is the only unilateral contract we have in the world or in the, in the real estate world. Okay. So an option is very much like layaway 
in the real estate world, all right? A buyer would go in to a seller and say, hey, look, I want the right to buy this property sometime in the next year. And I will buy it for $200,000 any time in the next year. That makes the seller who gives him the option to do that, what? The option or. The buyer would be the option E. And for that right to do that, he is going to give that option or the seller Look, I'll give you $5,000 today for the right to buy your property any time in the next year for $200,000. Does that buyer ever have to actually buy? The answer is no, just like layaway. He will lose his option consideration. That's the term, it's called option consideration. It's a pretty funny term, except they use the word consideration in there, because remember, that's one of the requirements for a legal contract. So to make this option a legal option, there has to be consideration, that is this amount. That makes that contract, that option contract, valid. Does the buyer ever have to actually buy? No. If he does go back at some time frame and says, hey, I decided I want to go ahead and buy that, the seller or the optioner would actually have to sell him the property because that was the agreement. It is the only unilateral contract that we use in real estate. Now, I have said that probably five times. Maybe there's a reason I have said that five times. 